Welcome to the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute. My name is Sabine Blazon. I am Director of Programs. CCC ADI has a rich 45 year legacy in amplifying and supporting cultural equity, arts, and culture. Today, we're especially excited to commemorate the 25th anniversary of Transforming the Crown Exhibition, highlighting Asian, Caribbean, and African artists from Britain. This is a landmark monumental exhibition. It was featured in the New York Times, and we had incredible partners such as Studio Museum, the Bronx Museum of the Arts, and we supported emerging curators such as Dr. Murray Beauchamp Bird, who is here with us today as a moderator and the curator of Transforming the Crown in conversation with two artists who are part of the exhibition. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Marie Beauchamp Bird. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> and um, before I begin, I'd like to uh, thank the Caribbean Cultural Center for having me here today. Um, and in particular, I would like to thank the uh, director of the CCC, uh, Melody Capote, um, Sabine Blazin, who um, has been assisting us with this uh, entire process of celebrating the show, and Dr. Melta Morena Vega, who was the director of the CCC when I was here as curator at the center. Um, also, Mario and Bianca for assisting with everything um, today from the uh, CCC, CCC side as well. And I wanna thank Rita Keegan, and Janice Chetty. Um, Rita Keegan was one of the exhibiting artists in the show, and Dr. Janice Chetty um, is an amazing scholar uh, from the UK um, who is here with us today to discuss this exhibition and the afterlife of this exhibition. What I'd like to do first uh, is to uh, provide you with an introduction to um, both Rita and Janice Chetty. Um, Rita Keegan was born in 1949 in the Bronx. She's an artist, lecturer, and archivist living in London. Her practice combines digital animation, textiles, painting, and copy art, often, you know, uh, focusing on the elusive and enduring powers of memory, drawing on her family experience and the archive of her family's uh, lives, a photographic record of a black middle-class Canadian family uh, that is, she has documented from the 1880s to the present day. Rita co-founded the Brixton Art Gallery in 1982, established the Women of Color Index in 1987, and was director of the African and Asian Visual Arts Archive until 1994. For many years, she was a lecturer in multimedia arts at Goldsmiths, the University of London. Her artwork is held in the Tate Collection and has been exhibited nationally and internationally, including um, in this show, um, <clears throat> and also at the Royal Academy, Innova, and at the British Museum, and also the Arnolfini Gallery in Bristol. In 2021, Rita's archive was presented at South London Gallery, followed by a solo exhibition of her work, accompanied by um, Mirror Reflect Reflecting Darkly, which is a new publication that was published by Goldsmiths Press and MIT. All of these activities formed part of the Rita Keegan Archive Project, a social history and curatorial collective that sought to preserve, exhibit, and share her special collections. In 2021, <clears throat> Rita was made an honorary fellow at Goldsmiths College, University of London. I'd like to uh, introduce Janice Chetty. Janice Chetty is, uh-oh, lots of papers. A London-based writer, researcher, and consultant 
She was born in St. Lucia, West Indies, and migrated to the UK as part of the children of Windrush generation. Between the mid-1990s and 2015, she was custodian of the Panchayat Special Collection with the artist and curator Shaheen Morali until its trans transfer to the Tate Library in 2015. And the Panchayat Collection um, consists of, uh, of uh, documentation, you know, including exhibition catalogs, books, journals, slides, and videos relating to cultural activities and activism in Britain um, <clears throat> between the 1980s and 2003. And Panchayat Collections is of central importance to the practice and exhibition uh, histories of artists with South Asian, Caribbean, and African heritage living and working in Britain during this period. Her essay entitled Panchayat, Justice in the Archive will be published by the Tate in winter 2022. And since 2015, she has been a member of ICOMOS UK's Intangible Cultural Heritage Committee. In 2020, since 2020, she has been a research consultant for London-based Afford Return of the Icons Initiative funded by the Open Society Foundation. <clears throat> I want to um, welcome you and I'm you know, really excited about um, having Rita and uh, having this conversation with Rita and Janice uh, today. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, I just want to give an introduction uh, to the show. Um, in October of 1997, uh, Rita Keegan discussed her 1986 self-portrait entitled Red Me. And you see that image on the top left. And um, she was speaking to a group of journalists, artists, and other onlookers at the Bronx Museum of the Arts in New York City. The event was a press preview for an exhibition that I had organized called Transforming the Crown, African, Asian, and Caribbean Artists in Britain, 1966 to 1996. And this was a show that was on view at three New York City venues, the uh, Bronx Museum of the Arts, Caribbean Culture Center, and the Studio Museum in Harlem from October of 1997 through March of 1998. It's considered the uh, first and only large-scale U.S. organized survey of Black British art. Um, the exhibition had uh, a catalog that included essays by Eddie Chambers, Okwi and Waysar, Kabina Mercer, Jelaine Tawadros, Ann Walmsley, Deborah Willis, and Judith Wilson. And it received quite a bit of critical attention. You know, that was largely positive, but also uh, shaped by a more generalized critique of what was called identity politics shows or black art shows that were, um, had been organized in the 1980s and 90s during a period where you heard the word multiculturalism quite often. And um, so for me, as curator at an institution, the Caribbean Cultural Center, that focused on the art and culture of the African diaspora, you know, with a rich array of programs that documented Yoruba and other belief systems and musical traditions in Brazil, Cuba, and Haiti, for example. You know, I envision Crown as really an extension of what the Caribbean Cultural Center's mission was um, in general. And so it was really about more looking at what was happening in terms of visual arts um, that was important uh, for me. During that, um, that week, uh, which began in the middle of October, 25 years ago, Rita um, was discussing her work in the Bronx. And we talked about that moment of, you know, describing the piece Red Me and other works and having this big audience there this press, uh, at this press preview. And she referred to that as a kind of homecoming, you know, stating that she had grown up in the Bronx, you know, relatively near to the museum site. And Rita, I have a questions for you about, you know, what did you mean by um, this homecoming and, and, you know, how were you feeling, you know, at that moment as well? Um, 
The museum was two blocks away from from my home, and um, and had a museum like that been in existence, it would have really, I, I it would have been an, an an extra lift, a place, other place to go besides the Metropolitan, and uh, would have given a, a a real different feeling. Not necessarily to what I made, but it would have um, it would have been a great support. How, how do you feel now, sort of being back in New York City as well? Well, I I kind it's like a dream because I recognize it and I don't recognize it. Um, I recognize the pace. I recognize the noise. I don't necessarily recognize the people. Um, it's gotten, I mean, I didn't know any WASP, <laughs> you know, I thought that white people were either Jewish, Irish, or Italian, um, and so the idea of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, they were, they were in Boston, <laughs> they weren't in New York, and, um, and also, it, you know, New York was, interesting and grimy and arty and it may still be I've only been here a day um, um, but it's um, there are bits and pieces that are recognizable and but other pieces that that aren't and that's the way with any city a city has to change but what what needs to happen is the inhabitants of the city need to to get a piece of that change as opposed to get pushed out um, which you know happens in London, uh, but you know for such a an old community of color, it's it's quite shocking to see the the changes, and that's just in a day. You know, if I was here longer, I don't know how I'd feel, but um, it's uh, it's it, like I say, I recognize it and I don't recognize it, and New York will always be will always be home, you know, um, and that's that's part and parcel. I mean, I'm staying in a part of New York that I would have, that I'd never stayed in before, you know. I'm near Macy's. We used to go there for Christmas every year. <laughs> never like Santa, but um, <laughs> but you know. So it's and there isn't. There's no horn and hardex. There's no. Um, you know, there's, I keep on seeing things that aren't there, um, which probably have disappeared a long time ago. But you know, I recognize the people. I recognize my tribe. Um, but the 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 show in in um, the in the Bronx Museum, because I was with all these British people that I knew from from there. And I was, and they're asking me all these questions about New York, and I couldn't think of, you know, where they get the best jeans, or where they do this. I just basically wanted to get to the pink tea cup and have some, <laughs> and have some peach cobbler and some real fried chicken, you know, some greens. Um, but it was, it was, it was a, it was a very disjointing experience. But the experience of the show was amazing to see the Studio Museum and see all this work that I knew in a different place. I mean, I think for the most part, most of the artists were incredibly hopeful and they hoped that the show would have legs and would, um, you know, everything leads to something, but not necessarily in the way you expect it to. What you see on the screen are, are some of the brochures and, and uh, flyers from some of the activities that the Caribbean Cultural Center uh, produced uh, in the 1990s and, and before that as well. Um, I started to develop Crown in, the late, in late 1993, soon after I began as a position as curator and director of special projects at uh, the center. And it's, it's, uh, there's a longer you know, term for the center, the Franklin H. Williams Caribbean Cultural Center, African Diaspora Institute, but it's often known as the Caribbean Cultural Center. And um, this was a center that had been established 
by Dr. Marta Morena Vega in 1976, and had long focused on global manifestations of African-based cultural and spiritual uh, traditions. Um, at the time that I was curator here, uh, the center was producing Carnival in New York, tribute to African diaspora women, lectures, conferences, school programs, dance and musical performances. Many of these events were focused on Spanish speaking Caribbean regions um, at the time. And at the center, I developed exhibition projects based on social history, um, which really fit squarely into the institution's mission of charting cultural expressions related to the African diaspora. And so here are some of the uh, projects that, um, you know, uh, projects with Celia Cruz and Mario Bauza and others, just this really exciting place. My um, tenure at the Caribbean Cultural Center, um, uh, I produced exhibitions that were focused on social history, but I wanted to make sure that um, because I was coming from an art history background and I was still a student, <laughs> you know, at uh, Columbia and NYU when I was here, um, I wanted to uh, make sure that the visual arts were something that were, um, you know, uh, central to the curatorial programming. Um, my shows included Cubop, The Life and Music of Mario Bowser, um, Transcending Silence, The Life and Poetic Legacy of Audre Lorde, The World View of Catherine Dunham, um, and Africa's Legacy, Photographs from Brazil and Peru by Laurie Sal Salcedo Mitrani. Um, 1996, I really started to focus on my own interests um, also with art-centered projects like Struggle and Serenity, the visionary art of Elizabeth Catlett. Um, I was also um, you know, keen to do a show on R.G. Lord too. And I'm so thankful because um, you know, uh, Marta Vega allowed me to, you know, um, you know, really explore my own interests. And 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 that was so important for a young curator at the very beginning, you know, of my career. And so um, you know, I'm very thankful for Marta and the center, you know, for allowing me those opportunities. Um, and here's just some of the covers of the publications that we produced. But Transforming the Crown was by far the largest and most extensive <laughs> in terms of 200 and something pages of a catalog. So what you're seeing here are some images from the uh, Bronx Museum uh, installation. And, um, and so I ended up you know, at first I thought I was gonna do a smaller show um, just at the Caribbean Cultural Center. And it became clear as I went back and forth to England that I needed uh, more space and that I wanted to do something different. So I ended up with 50 plus artists <laughs> and over 200 works of art. Um, and these were, you know, paintings, a sculpture, prints, uh, video installations, um, you know, just a broad, range of objects. And I had previously worked at the Studio Museum in Harlem and at the uh, Bronx Museum and um, went to the directors and the curatorial staff there and asked, can we do this together? And what I was interested in, one of the things I was interested in was sharing audiences. Each institution, the center, the Studio Museum, and the Bronx Museum had a very different audience. Some of it based on place, and some of it based on, you know, um, just the kind of generational, you know, shifts for each of those institutions. And we started to have meetings, um, and um, the directors and the curatorial staff agreed, you know, to work with us that we would split the show into all of those spaces. And the kind of structure of the show, I really uh, grouped each section into a thematic uh, section because. I was trying to be mindful too of the space that I was working with at each of the places, you know. And so I decided on the thematic, you know, sections. And so um, what you see here is the high ceilings of uh, the Bronx Museum, and um, you know that where I was able to um, uh, use uh, that space for a lot of the installations and the large paintings. And um, at the Caribbean Cultural Center, I had uh, the work of Vanley Burke, 
um, which was, you know, part of the show, but it had its own title, its own section. And these were life-size prints, uh, framed prints, they were massive, of Burke's, you know, very rich uh, photographic imagery that paid tribute to the artist's lengthy documentation of Afro-Caribbean families in formerly industrialized towns like Birmingham, you know. And um, I wanted to really look at uh, those images, many of them from uh, the 60s and 70s and 80s, um, and that was important as well. And these are some of the images from um, the exhibition installation. Um, I have a lot of images with uh, folks during the opening receptions. Um, I was so excited because um, my aunt who raised me, Aunt Helen, who you see up on the left, um, on the far right of that image, uh, came up from New Orleans with her uh, best friend, Miss Jackie, who's in the middle between us. Um, and I was able to um, have uh, Barbara Smith um, uh, also came. Uh, she came to a lot of the Caribbean Cultural Center uh, events that I organized. Uh, the scholar and activist and founder of Kitchen Table Press, you see her at the center at top. And then um, you see uh, my good friend uh, from NYU, uh, Krista Blackwood there with my aunt and, uh, and Miss Jackie. And then on the right, Melody Capote, who is now director at the center, um, introducing uh, a part of the reception for the Van Lee Burke show. And then next to me is uh, Leslie Sanderson and Anita McKenzie, who are both in the show um, as well. Um, there's another image that's getting, you know, but that image has um, Hassan Aliu, Leslie Sanderson, Jugenda Lamba, and Emmanuel Jagade, who were also um, in the show as well. Now here you see um, some images from studio, the Studio Museum installation, um, images with uh, Melody Capote, group shots uh, with us, Gil Lewison, who was a, um, who was, uh, who did a lot of the editing for catalogs here at the center, and Kinshasa Holman Conwell, speaking with uh, me and with Ingrid Pollard up on the top uh, left there. And, um, and then a group picture with the artists um, that, uh, that was taken at Studio Museum at the top right. Rita is there next to me um, as well. Um, here I have um, images that were also taken at Studio Museum with uh, my friend Richard Bloom um, there at the center next to uh, Const uh, Judge Constance Baker Motley, Motley sorry, um, Judge of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. She was the first African-American woman to argue uh, before the Supreme Court. She won numerous uh, landmark civil rights cases. And uh, Ricky had been a clerk for uh, Judge Motley, so she was there at the studio opening. And then there's Rita with the artist uh, Ben Jones. And, um, and then some other uh, photographs there with, uh, with uh, Dr. Marta Vega and, and Melody Capote there. All right. And here's a group shot with uh, all of the directors there. And um, I think most of the museum directors there. And then um, most of the artists who had come uh, to the reception. Rita, I have a question for you. What do you remember about the opening receptions? It was, they were really good. They were really exciting. There are lots of people there. And, um, and that there was so much to pack into three days. And, um, and the reception was, was really supportive. And, um, you know, even though a lot of us worked in the same country. We didn't necessarily get to see each other often. So that was really exciting for most of us to actually get a chance to, to be here and doing. So they were, um, they were amazing and they were exciting. Thank you. So what you're looking at here are some images uh, that were taken um, over the four years that I was working on this show and going back and forth to England. And um, I feel like during this process, you know, I was serving as a kind of uh, archivist, photographer, promoter of the artist's work, sometimes therapist and sometimes a friend. 
<laughs> so during every studio visit, I photographed the artists and their work, and I built up a rich body of archival material, some of which you're seeing today, that documented artists living and working in the UK in the mid to late 90s. Many of these artists had been active during the Black Arts Movement in the 80s and 90s, and they had not at the time attracted the mainstream visibility of other British artists like Damien Hirst or Tracy Emin and uh, Sam Taylor Wood, for example, or like older established British artists like David Hockney and Anthony Caro and Henry Moore, for example. I felt that my documentation of these artists, of their presence and their work, was critical to British art history. Um, it was also critical to studies of global modernism and also to the charting of art in its social, cultural, and political context. And I have a question for both Rita and Janice. And, um, and what I wanna ask is what do you think is the role of the curator now? And I'll start with you, Janice. Um, it's actually quite interesting because I think if you look at the wider context, because this shows nearly 10 years after, if not quite, um, the two importantly shows. One is the oh, Havana Biennale of 1989, which is now marked as the moment that art goes global when it begins to look at the global South. And so this, it, which challenges modernism and the way we think about history now. And then obviously the, in relationship to Britain, you have the other story, which is curated by Bashir Dareen, was at the Hayward Gallery in London and documented what he calls Afro-Asian artists um, from the post, from mostly the post-war period, but there were some artists who were working in Britain in the 1920s and 30s through to kind of the early 80s. So I think that this is kind of needs to be put in, in relationship to that context. Now, I think there's a change in the way the curator works. I think if you look at what was happening in the 80s, um, particularly of the artists who are trying to rethink modernism. So if you look at Rashid Areen, he was very much a kind of a, a historical, um, kind of chronological kind of curator who was very much looking to establish who were the pioneers, who that we could argue um, established or made new ways of working or made impacts and then left particular legacies. So it was very particular, almost, um, want, without wanting to say the word, the bar approach to kind of the kind of curating that there was an underway that we could think through these moments of modernism in this very kind of chronological way. I think what begins to happen, I think also you're kind of a, um, a kind of precursor of that or, or within that tradition is that it becomes a new kind of curation, which begins to look at the wider context, which not only in terms of what the artists are doing, who they're related to, but also the wider context in which they're kind of operated. So there is a new way of thinking about how we think about art history, what's important, but more importantly, who is the artist? So particularly in this work, a lot of the artists are women. They're working in different kind of um, techniques and that. And I think that's a marked shift in the way somebody like Rashid Devine would have curated that kind of show. So I think the role of the creator becomes much more as a facilitator and, a, and also there's an archivist role as you, you maintain within that the kind of thing. But I think particularly at this moment, it, it's also about Thinking, thinking through, which I think are, are still unresolved, what is a kind of black aesthetic, and what do, was that, what does that mean in relationship to how we think about contemporary practice? So I think those weren't necessarily the questions that someone like Irene would have been more uh, talking about. He was much more looking at how can we slot black artists into this kind of tradition of the historical canon. I think that 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 is no longer really the concern of younger black curators today, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, I, um, <clears throat> I have a question, you know, for both of you, and I wanna <clears throat> talk about what's been happening, I would say the last uh, six, six to seven years. I've been asked to speak about this show. Um, there was a, uh, you know, at, at various places and you know, and some of that has been, is being published now, um, including a, uh, a 
conference called Reshaping the Field um, that was organized uh, by Bard College in, uh, in uh, 2021. Um, and um, so there's been increasing interest in the 1980s and 1990s uh, Black Arts Movement in the UK. And, um, and one of the things that uh, I've been thinking about every time you know, I'm asked to uh, have that discussion is um, what is the role of the survey exhibition? And um, part of that is a response to the criticism of those shows that have been seen as identity politics shows from that period, from the 80s and 90s. And um, Transforming Crown has, you know, been seen as one of those kinds of shows. And um, and I've been thinking about what is the afterlife of those shows, because it's not just the show. Um, the afterlife of an exhibition is um, the exhibition catalog, which you'll have, you know, in perpetuity. Um, it's also all of the scholarship that comes after that references that show or that examines uh, the impact of that show or the artists that were involved um, in that show. And so um, one of the um, questions that I have uh, for you, and for me, I think about this a lot. It's almost like a defense of the survey exhibition, particularly in light of the fact that um, when this show was done, um, we, I didn't have access to the internet. We didn't, we weren't doing that um, at the time. Um, this is something we did with faxes and letters and phone calls and visits to England. Um, there was no Google uh, for me. I didn't even have a cell phone. Um, so um, it was uh, a very different way of doing a show. And at the very beginning when I was conceiving of this exhibition, I was looking at the exhibition catalogs from before, like the Decade Show or Interrogating Identity at NYU uh, that traveled. And that's really where I went to um, develop a list of potential artists, you know, uh, for the show. And so I, I could never say that those exhibition catalogs that were about survey group shows, um, they were very important to me. And I think they're still important. And, um, and so uh, part of what I've been thinking about is a kind of response to the kind of critique of survey exhibitions, which are seen as having too many artists in them to where you can't fully examine an individual artist. But I always see them as starting points. They're seeds, you know? And I wanna talk about um, this idea of an afterlife of an exhibition like Transforming the Crown. Um, I'll start with you, Janice. What do you think about this idea of the role and usefulness of the survey exhibition? I mean, I, I think there's uh, there's two kind of thing um, issues here. Really, is that why is it particularly important to kind of have a survey show? So, if you look at in relationship, if we're talking about politically black art in the, in the UK is that the, the 1989 exhibition of The Other Story is largely a survey show of artists of color who are working in that moment. It's largely a survey show, yes, but I think the reason why it's seen as historically important is because it's that moment when it begins to question the idea of what is art history, what is the, the idea of the, the artistic canon. And so I think that that the survey shows operate at different points at diff in different moments. And I think coming on the back of Musicians de la Terre, um, the Havana Biennale, which all, which all happened around the same time, we begin to see that, that what Rashida Reno do, was doing around the, the show, survey show. And I think very important for people who are in art school now is, is establishing this idea that there are artists of color working in Britain and there is a history for those young people who are in college now to look at and, and back and that and that is actually a landmark exhibition in return that it gathers all the artists together in one place and also presents the other things that are also in the survey show of like the CVs the kind of the, where they, they've shown who's written about the work so it's an incredibly important research document exactly. and for many of the artists that you 
these artists that you have here are largely show artists that have kind of exhibitions because for many, particularly pre-internet, there's the only thing that's left is the ephemera of the time because there often isn't a catalogue. Um, there isn't necessarily a review of the show. So it's, it's really important. So I think the survey show is a snapshot of particular ideas and things which are current at the moment. And I think it's what's really interesting was I was really looking at the catalogue because this this year also marks the 25th anniversary of the sensation show at the Royal Academy. Okay. And I think looking back at that catalogue is really interesting because the, the 1988 show, which was curated by Damien Hurst, Freeze, happens 88, just before the year before the survey show. But within that period, by 1987, everybody is suddenly saying, you know, black art really wasn't an artist practice. Um, so it was also the year that I entered to, to, to entered art school. You couldn't talk about black artists at all. It was like black art was dead. Um, you know, there was no point. This was all identity politics. 25 years later, there's almost what Eddie Chambers has recently called in the lecture, a fetishization of that particular moment. And, and looking back now, there is so much research interest in, in the terms of the approaches to material, um, ways of thinking about curating, ways of collectivization around the period. But more importantly, an interrogation of that experience of migration what does it mean to be in a place where you're not, where you're of, but not necessarily from, or that you exist within kind of multiple kind of histories that you have to kind of negotiate? And what happens to you when you're confronted with the, this art school, which is about a very particular way of kind of articulating what, what the aesthetic is, what the material is, what, what's the way of making, making kind of work and what kind of approaches there are to work. So I think that they're, those are the really important things that those shows, because kind of, they are the snapshot of who was working at the time, what kind of issues were working. They're not the only thing because there were other kinds of ways of practice. And often as in, you can see with the transforming the crown, transforming the crown didn't really see what was would happen by, you know, with sensation when, you know, it's a very white, um, kind of um, movement, which actually c completely ignores that generation of artists and says that those artists didn't exist, their work wasn't really important. But 25 years later, in Britain as well, you know, we've, we've seen the show, that piece of work that you just um, read me, it was just been bought, bought by the Tates um, last week by um, um, at, when it was at, exhibited at the Freeze Art Fair in London. So it's 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 kind of, they're important because they're markers of a show but they as you say they're not the only thing which tells you about that if you really want to know you have to do more research but they are signposts and kind of breadcrumbs about what are the what where what is seen as important at the time and what's important and i think within the history of these kind of exhibition making particularly for kind of artists and curators working in Britain, it's really about what are we thinking about material? What are we thinking about the way we construct who is in the subject, who's the subject of painting, who's missing from painting, who, and, and why suddenly it's important to have an engagement and interrogation with movement which allows multi-voices uh, multi within the theory, M many ways of kind of viewing who is, who is the audience for that work, they're all those kind of questions which the work begins to kind of continually interrogate and which are still with us today in an answer. So I think the survey shows have their, their role, but they aren't the only way of thinking about art making and what artists were doing at that particular moment. Thank you. And Rita, the same question for you. What do you feel is the role of the survey exhibition? Um, two years ago, I had, um, I got a lottery grant and it s supported me in putting together a publication, an exhibition, and sorting out my archive. And my archive, I don't, I don't necessarily acknowledge that I'm a collector, a pack rat, a, 
you know, hoarder. I'm not a hoarder. Uh, and, um, and also, it's, there's things that just stick with you. So I had, I had catalogs and flyers and ephemera from exhibitions from the 80s onwards. And I guess the thing that struck me is we are all much of a very paper um, um, generation, and now they're, they're, it's very hard to find those paper markers. You may have things on your phone, but you don't get an invite to an exhibition. You don't get, um, you, you, when you go to an exhibition, you don't even get a list of what's for sale, if anything's for sale. And I felt that it was quite important to, um, to get my archive out of my house, and which is why um, I donated it to Goldsmiths, because I wanted it to go to a university where people would have access, because we know that um, museums and galleries have their own another level. Um, and all you have to do is take a part-time course and you would have access. So, um, and what I did is I invited, there are two people here who I invited to write articles. And um, it's, it's um, a mixture of my work and the times from the 80s to 2000. And it is very interesting that, that mine goes about 10 years p past that. But by 2000, the, actually by mid-90s, the exhibitions of survey shows were just really thin, if they were at all. And um, you, um, people just went underground. They found, they found whatever jobs they could. They exhibited locally. And um, something that seemed to have promise, as I said, never had legs. So there, weren't, there wasn't necessarily a follow-on for the um, for the artist to to show, uh, there's a very different um, gallery structure in Britain. You don't have as many private galleries. So over here, there's there's a gallery for every type of work, whereas in in this in in England, there's only a gallery for a few type of works. So I mean, I think that that's that's. That's one of the things that made people just produce work in their homes and hold on to it, you know, and wait for the next survey show. Thank you, Rita. I, um, you know, Crown was really meant to be an introduction for a North American audience um, to a lot of the artists in the show. Some of them had shown in uh, projects that was organized by uh, Kelly Jones, the art historian, uh, as well as others. And, um, but um, I realized I needed a larger group of art artists because um, as I went back and forth to England and I talked about this in the catalog um, and I would come back home, people would ask me, are there really a lot of black people in England? And so I felt that um, a big part of what I was doing as a curator too for a show like this was to document these artists in their studios to document um, these artists in terms of the uh, exhibitions that they were involved in. And, um, and I started to um, make sure that I, you know, photographed uh, them as much as possible, you know, as I went back and forth. You, what you're looking at is some of the <laughs> archival material. Um, there's Anita Jenny McKenzie, there's Charlotte Berman, um, there is uh, Eugene Palmer, and Faisal Abdullah, there's Ajamu there at the bottom right, and then Lubaina Hemet at the top uh, right, who I visited quite a lot because uh, she was in my dissertation. Um, can I have the next slide, please? And then uh, artists like Sunil Gupta, um, who I knew his work from the photographs that he did for Looking for Langston, that uh, amazing Isaac Julian film. And um, in the show, I had uh, pretended family relationships um, uh, that was at the Bronx Museum as part of, of the crown and um, also documenting him in his studio um, 
uh, several times as well. So thinking about this idea of an afterlife, you know, for the show, and I know that, you know, there's of course the catalog, there's the public pro programming that happens. And um, what you see on the left is uh, the pages of the, uh, you know, the kind of free distribution brochure that people were able to take away with them. And so that's another uh, kind of document because on the back of that was a listing of the public programs uh, for the show. And then on the far right, you see the flyer for Color Screens, which was a film series that uh, was produced uh, for the exhibition. Um, and we worked with uh, the Tisch School of the Arts at NYU in collaboration with it. And those programs were held at, uh, at NYU. And um, Isaac Julian and uh, uh, the filmmaker Isaac Julian and, and the scholar uh, Mae Joseph and others introduced uh, different nights of that uh, film series. So thinking about this idea of, you know, um, representation and um, and with the questions that I got when I would come back home, I made sure that there was uh, photographs of everyone in the in the exhibit. And uh, some of them were images that the artists uh, you know sent to me. other times I got uh, photographs done by um, uh, Sharon Wallace and others and um, and so you'll see those pages that are there of uh, the photographs, and um, just in terms of the structure, before I get to uh, the next question, um, the uh, there were were a few um, sections where I was thinking about chronology. I knew that I had to document the Caribbean artist movement, and so those images were in one gallery at the Studio Museum, and um, and then Ann Walmsley, who did. The, um, the seminal publication on the movement, um, wrote a catalog, wrote an uh, essay for the catalog. And um, I also knew I had to document the Black Arts Movement, you know, and, um, you know, Janice is talking about this sort of uh, increasing interest in the Black Arts Movement that is happening now. Um, and, uh, and, you know, some of it is too a, a sort of celebration of certain key figures within that movement. And um, I'm hoping that they, will uh, that interest will go beyond just the 80s and early 90s. And, um, and so there's just some images there um, that uh, some works by Keith Piper, Donald Rodney, um, an image of uh, Marlene Smith, Eddie Chambers, and Donald Rodney there. And, uh, and in some of the catalogs that Eddie Chambers uh, produced uh, on the right. And then um, I knew I had to document the curatorial practices and um, as well as the art making um, uh, practices by uh, the artist Luvaina Hemet, who won the Turner Prize in 2017. And um, so it's just really interesting to see this interest in uh, Luvaina and Rita and Sonia Boyce, who won the Golden Lion um, recently in Venice. Um, and Veronica Ryan and Ingrid Pollard, all of this interest that's taking place, I'm really excited uh, to see. Uh, also documenting um, publications that were produced by the artists like Polarize, um, which included the work of, of uh, artists of African and Asian descent um, coming together as uh, women who were photographers and publishing this uh, you know, very seminal uh, publication. All right, here's where uh, Rita and Janice, I have some questions for you. Um, certainly thinking about this idea of an afterlife for a show, uh, we have to think about the critical analysis of the show, whether it's an exhibition review or a journal article that uh, documents uh, that show. And so um, there's a scan there of the uh, New York Times uh, coverage that uh, a, you know, a review by Holland Cotter that came out maybe three days after the show uh, opened. And I was excited that there were, you know, it was on the front page of the uh, weekend section and uh, seemed largely positive, but you know, as a curator, you're gonna focus on any kind of critique and be like, oh, I messed up completely. <laughs> and, that's, and that's how I was feeling. Um, even though everybody kept saying, okay, it's in the New York Times. I was just still, <laughs> you know, you think about everything uh, negative. 
Um, there was an article in India Today, uh, American Visions. Uh, there was a Duke conference where Judith Wilson, who had uh, written an essay for the catalog, um, talked about the criticism of you know, transforming the crown there. Um, and then in the life, which was a um, LGBTQ um, TV news magazine, um, had a, a, a pretty lengthy segment um, in 1998 when the show was still up. And, um, and it, there were interviews with me, interviews with Isaac Julian about the show. Um, and it was, uh, I think episode 704, but this was a news magazine that was around from uh, the late 90s to 2012. But I have a question for Janice and, um, and Rita about, <clears throat> you know, the criticism that is, uh, is still taking place. I mean, some of it is uh, celebratory or thinking about the exhibition, you know, in hindsight, looking back and thinking about its function and what has happened in terms of the artist. And there's also still criticism of me not, you know, focusing on the seventies enough, um, things like that, or, um, you know, just a range of things, but, um, you know, how are you uh, both feeling now in terms of the criticism and what you think about thinking about the afterlife of an exhibition and its critical analysis? I'll start with you, Janice. I mean, I, I think there's two things. I mean, I think the over thing, arching thing, which is, is really about that relationship between what was broadly called by called Paul Gilroy, the Black Atlantic. So there's constant dialogue and exchange, particularly in Britain, which looks both to, Af um, into, at that moment, it would have been looking to North America, particularly the US, but also the influences between the Caribbean. So th I think the show is part of that broad intellectual tradition of the exchanges between people who live here, people of color coming to, 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 to England for various reasons, sometimes going on to Europe or coming back and forth. So the example here would be um, Rita's uncle who was shown in the recent show, Keith Simon, who, you know, was born in the Caribbean, educated, um, in the US, comes to to England in the 1950s, teaches, and it's part of the art scene in the 60s, and then returns. So I think the show is in some ways part of that, following that tradition around that. So I think no show is ever going to actually look at anything. And there, there's always shown through the lens of the curator, what the what is important to the creator, at the at the time, okay. yeah, at that moment, I think that's also part of the of the reading of the of, of the show. I think it's really difficult, it, particularly if you look at the seventies. Things were quite dispersed. So, like Frank Bolin was here in the beginning of the seventies, then he came back to the UK. Um, so it's following those kind of breadcrumbs of where the artists were, where the traditions. And also there's almost a trajectory. If you look at people like Frank Bolin and FN D'Souza, mm -hmm. who were very big in the UK, mm -hmm. came to the States to try and kind of further their career and then suddenly got dropped. I think there's a lesson here in terms of that, that kind of arc of trajectory of what, and I think what the show does is, is, is give us these kind of troughs and fallows in the work of an artist, because there's an, an idea that somehow that this is going to be the moment where there, there's this big breakthrough. And actually, often, is if you look through those three decades of the show, that actually that, that doesn't happen for various reasons of, of what's 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 going on. So I think, in terms of the criticism, a lot of the criticism is still rooted in not really understanding different ways of thinking about processes about making of making i think and different ways in which those artists are actually involved in quite different ideas of a how things people come to art so if you look at a lot of the artists that came to britain in the 40s 50s and 60s most of them didn't come to be artists they came to be lawyers or they Doctors. came to engineers so there is that kind of different thing of of what that 
what a career is. Generation. And I think there's also, there needs to be a rethinking, particularly if you're looking at women artists, so what the kind of, um, the kind of art historian um, Flick Allen calls the deserve, which is this relationship between, so that an artist, a Western artist is supposed to have this of this idea of a consistency of work, consistency of practice that you can follow through. Mm -hmm. And so therefore for the gallery, they understand what they're getting. Whereas if you're talking about women artists or artists of color, this idea of the earth is always disrupted because they have to do something else. Their practice has changed. They may move countries. They suddenly have to move out of studios. So this, this kind of consistency of, of locating that kind of earth of a practice is actually mm -hmm. most quite rare for those artists, yeah. particularly artists who came to Britain in the 60s and 70s because of the, the nature of their practice. So I think that this idea that you can just, I think that a lot of the criticism didn't really understand how difficult it was for, for marginalized artists to maintain the practice of consistency. And I think that's sort of missing. There's almost an equivalence between it's the same, it's not. Because for women artists and artists of color, there's always been a change or disruption of practice. And that's to do with the wider infrastructure infrastructural structures yeah. around the arts world, which is lack of access to galleries, lack of access to um, those major shows, mm -hmm. all those kind of things put blocks into those. And a lot of the ways the, art, the work responds or the artist responds is like changing practice or rethinking the practice in relationship to that. So I think that, I think for me, that would be the fundamental criticism as is this kind of, refusal to kind of actually engage with the material production, which kind of influences the way artists have to make work. So I think mm -hmm. this kind of criticism where, you know, you should have looked at this, you could have looked at yeah. the nature of the, the practice is itself disrupted mm -hmm. and um, changing because of this lack of being able to have the infrastructure to maintain that practice. Mm -hmm. So I think that so that so for me looking at it for me as an afterlife, I I see that because a lot if you follow a lot of those artists, somebody like Shia Berman would be example. Like since she had the Tate Winter Commission in um, the winter of 2020, 21, there's mm -hmm. kind of been a major change. But if you look at Shia's work is that there's always been a change in the practice because she's not had the access to those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Whereas she has a consistency of practice, the nature of the practice, and this is what I, what I think Fleck Allen means by the deserve, this, this kind of, because of the lack of these kind of structures, which means that you can function as an artist, yeah. lack of a- Consistently. Yeah, consistently. Yeah. So I think that would be, that would be one of the things I think is not looked at in a lot of the criticism. And this, and it's this dismissal, is it, for identity politics, refuses to engage with the different ways artists to negotiate with material, mm -hmm. negotiate time mm -hmm. as well in terms of how the pra practice may have to be condensed. And that, that different durational moments of time and temporality which exist in, the, in yeah. the practice. I think there was a kind of a refusal to kind of engage with that. So that would be my yeah. kind of looking at it from, 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 you know, in hindsight, I think, yeah. yeah. Initial open when there was just great pushback against anything that was considered a kind of multiculturalism or looking at any kind of. Uh, I mean, I mean that's the politics. irony of it, yeah. though, isn't it? Because I mean, the reason why people are suddenly so obsessed with the eighties is one is the the sheer large ecology of creative artists of color that were working together, supporting each yeah. other, um, and. Um, th rethinking about curation, so the collective ways of making. They were also archiving their own work, but also they were fully engaged with practice mm -hmm. in terms of rethinking about what you could do with the video, what you could do with photographs, and also the nature of collaboration. What does that mean within that? So mm -hmm. I think that, that so because it because it's fundamentally engaged with practice and making. Mm -hmm. This is why people are interested in the eighties. If it was sure purely about, you know, what is about identity, I think people because identity has changed so much since mm -hmm. the eighties. Mm -hmm. You know, the demographics of the UK have changed. But what's exciting, I think, for people who are now 
kind of like thirties that they're looking back at a large ecology of, of, of Wake and new ways of thinking about curating, but also mm -hmm. a real full engagement with practice. What does it mean to make this thing? Um, what are, what are, you know, and, and a lot of the work was at the cusp of when there was this movement into kind of digital video and, and, and there's, and so a lot of the work is actually an engagement with, with technology. So if you look at, so if you look at Rita's work, you know, mm -hmm. this copy art work, mm -hmm. that's why the Tate's interested in it because it was artists looking at these kind of new te media. technology yeah. medium and actually using them in kind of creative ways around that. So I think, a lot of the work is fundamentally engaged with practice and engaged with material. Otherwise, I don't think that people would really be talking about it. Yeah. About that. But it's also about making sure that they don't reinvent the wheel. So in some ways, the survey show is almost fundamental to that, that they realize that there was this kind of consistency of practice from the post-war period mm -hmm. right until the kind of post and in in some ways it's an unbroken consistency of practice mm -hmm. even though there's the the the, the areas of visibility change mm -hmm. so for me the criticism really is almost a refusal to engage with the kind of wider contextual aspect of the ways in which those artists have to, had to work with yeah. going back to your question yeah yeah i um am always impressed by the sheer number of artists that were functioning as artists producing their own work, but they were also curating. Yeah. They were also opening galleries. Yeah. They were publishing, they were making sure that um, that they and others' works, you know, in their, uh, you know, that they knew were, were being published in, in some way. So um, I was just really impressed with that. Um, you know, kind of, of ensuring that your work is seen, but others are seen as well. That was important. Rita, um, do you have any thoughts about, um, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts about the criticism that came? Well, it's, it's always easy to criticize and really hard to do. Um, and, and that's one of the main things that, and also it depends on what your agenda is. Um, that, you know, you can see gaps but unless there's something to see the gap, you don't. Um, but, you know, a, a, when you curate a show, you are given a certain amount of, of information or data or images, and you find a way to work it, especially show, a mixed media show. Um, and and it's, d curating is difficult. Hanging is difficult. I mean, I've... I've done it all, and it is, you know, it is very, very hard. But um, I guess that's why I I believe in archives because there's a whole section now at Goldsmiths that has is transforming the crown. It's all the it's all the papers that you sent. It's the newspaper article. There's even I even gave them my catalog, <laughs> and that it is important that that there is a record of things that went on and that people can research it. Because an exhibition only lasts five minutes. And what, what you have is the ephem ephemera. That's the thing that's left at the end of the day. And, um, and it's, it's very easy to have ephemera on your computer, but it, you have no control over that. I mean, all you need is a different system, and that information is gone, and who knows who will control it. So I think those are, are, are real issues, and the tangible, the, the work on walls, the, the pieces of paper are so important um, for some sort of longevity, and also so that People don't have to reinvent the wheel. That you can see a piece of work and say, oh, I like that. Oh, that's similar to mine. I guess I can do something else. And that's what's important is that you have, a, that every artist and every person has a frame of reference. And um, I mean, I think that's, that's one of the advantages of survey shows. You, you get, but you go into, uh, what is a museum other than a survey show? It's just sung on the walls. 
So um, it's a, survey shows are temporary. That's the only difference. When I've been asked to speak about the show or, or discuss what has happened since, I know that part of that is, you know, what's happened with my own scholarship in terms of the artists that were included in the show. Um, uh, what you're looking at is uh, in 2005, I um, wrote a catalog essay about Vanley Burke's work for a show that was at the Whitechapel Art Gallery called Back to Black, Art, Cinema, and the Racial Imaginary. And um, this was really looking at um, you know, his uh, work, uh, particularly an image called Boy with Flag, which was used for a lot of the publicity for uh, Transforming the Crown. Um, this young boy with the Union Jack, uh, you see uh, here. And, um, and that's one part of that afterlife of the show. Another part in terms of my own scholarship is that uh, my dissertation, which looked at uh, Hogarth's work, the 18th century British uh, printmaker and painter, and uh, the way that David Hockney, Lavena Hemed, and Paul Arrego um, reworked some of those you know, uh, narratives, those uh, narratives that dealt with morality and, and also about uh, you know, things like race and class. And, um, and so I, you know, was uh, working with uh, Lavena Hammond extensively, going back and forth to Preston and documenting uh, her work to get ready for the dissertation. And um, in 2019, I uh, wrote an article for the Burlington, uh, online version of the Burlington, Burlington, um, and Burlington Contemporary is what it's called. And it was about looking at the theatrical references in Levena's uh, work. And then um, in 2021, um, Rita had, you know, an amazing project that she's, uh, that she referenced. Um, she uh, had a show that was presented at the South London Gallery, you know, followed by a solo exhibition of a work that was accompanied by a text called Mirror Reflecting Darkly, a new essay in archival collection. And um, I wrote um, an essay for that publication. Janice wrote an essay as well and, and, and some other uh, uh, scholars. And these were part of the Rita Keegan archive. And so um, this is one of the, uh, for me, one of the, what I wrote about was really my curatorial practice with Rita. Um, she had a show at the British Museum. I documented that as well. You know, really this, you know, look at how an artist uh, is, you know, how an, a curator will engage with an artist over time and documenting their work. I focused on her self-portraits uh, in, um, in that essay. Um, here's some images of the self-portraits. And for many of the artists that were in uh, Transforming the Crown, self-portraiture kept coming up again and again, you know? And so I knew that there was something very important for Rita. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, her aims and focusing on, uh, on uh, self-portraits. You know, there was this sort of really interesting pop sensibility that I saw um, in those images. And, um, and Rita talked about being very meticulous in crafting, um, you know, her hairstyle, you know, facial expression the use of you know, uh, what she wore and textiles. And so Rita, what I wanted to ask you was, you know, what was so important about uh, self-portraiture? This is, uh, you, know, you return to self-portraiture again and again. And uh, what is it about self-portraiture self that was important to you uh, in terms of your body of work? Well, I think, I think it's, it's, it is about self-representation, but it's also, as a, a painter, you um, you can invite people to sit for you, and they show up or they don't show up. And as an artist, you always have yourself, and it's and you can experiment um, with how you want to how you want to paint yourself. Uh, there's things that I would not necessarily do to someone else. Like if I'm doing a collage, I would I feel it's really um, it's, it's problematic ripping up somebody's image. And I, I guess I come from the sort of feminist practice that um, 
had to have ownership of the image, and ultimately, which, I, which is why I use my family images, because they're mine, and, uh, and I use myself. And that, you know, so if, if I wanted to paint, um, um, and I wanted to use me as representation uh, of, of women, of all women, of black women, and also to look beyond the surface. Um, when, you are, when you paint yourself, you're looking beyond the surface. There's also an image on the right. If we can see that image, I wanted to take note of that. Um, there's an image at the top right, and this is an image called um, Red Dress. And I just wanted to mention that um, later I started to uh, work as curator at the Amistad Research Center in New Orleans. And I wanted to make sure that some of the artists from the show were represented in that collection. So Red, Red Dress is, uh, is in that collection now. It's been exhibited at the New Orleans Museum of Art. And, uh, and you know, that's a, a key part of that work, thinking about um, making sure that uh, there's this really amazing repository for uh, some of those works, readers' work and other artists' works are brought into uh, that collection. I wanted to think about that trajectory of this work of art, that here's Rita talking about this work. This work has been shipped from London and brought to the Bronx, and here she's discussing it in 1997. Um, the work is now on view at uh, the Freeze Art Fair in London. And, uh, and, um, and so um, you see some images there with um, two of the artists from the show posted, uh, you know, images of themselves in front of Red Me. Uh, there's Shaheen Morali and there's Hassan Aliou that were both in Transforming the Crown. And then on the right, um, this is the coverage of Rita in The Guardian, where they talk about, you know, um, her project in, um, in 2021 and, um, and just thinking about, you know, the sort of the route of the actual works that were in the show. Some of the other works by other artists are now being bought by uh, special collections. Yes, yeah. that was bought on oh, yeah. the site when it was, that was what was bought. Mm -hmm. They saw it at Freeze and then they bought it. So, um, and then that last uh, image there. So Rita, this is your, um, on the right, uh, your work called Jump Up. That is um, a um, work that is engaging with the history of Althea McNish's work. Althea McNish was also in the show as part of the section on the Caribbean artist movement. And I remember going um, to um, her house and having these really wonderful discussions with, uh, with her and, and with her husband. And um, this is a show that's up now at the William, is it still up now? It's not, it was at the William Morris Gallery. And um, it was a celebration of and tribute to Althea McNish's work and other artists engaged with it. So Rita's work um, on the right is looking at that history. Althea McNish was um, a, uh, a textile designer, um, you know, brought in an emphasis on, you know, a more tropical print into British textile design. And um, she was a very important part of uh, British history, British art history. And, um, and so I'm really pleased about these projects that look at, uh, you know, the impact of artists like uh, Althea McNish. And, um, and so Rita, um, I just had one last uh, question for you. Um, and you know, I know about this project, but I was wondering about what is, what are you working on now? What are you planning for now? This is the very hand. Um, <laughs> um, the, I mean, that, that was, um, they commissioned me to do a piece in response to Althea's work. And I felt it was, I could have done a pastiche of her drawing and, 
but I felt it was really important to represent her. And I wanted to um, put a black woman's hand touching a black woman's fabric. So, you know, I wanted a relationship with her, not, not, uh, um, and not um, appropriating her work. So that, it, that was one of the things. And, and um, I think I, I know this sounds really pretentious, but I think I just had a show open in Melbourne, but because I was thinking so much about my transatlantic cruise and I just produced the work, that that was my, you know, and, and because they didn't send me to Melbourne, <laughs> but, um, and what I produced there was a, um, a portrait of my, my desk and it's with, with all sorts of stuff on it. And on, on the top, I have um, family photographs and things. So it's like the ancestors are always watching. And it's also, you know, an homage to Hannah Hawk, you know, created at the kitchen table. We, you know, make work that we can fold up and put away in a box, that we have various different surfaces that we work on. And we don't all have the luxury of a fabulous giant studio. And, you know, so it, that's one of the things. And I was also told at the moment I have people that I'm, for the exhibition at the South London Gallery, I had staff. For the first time in my life, I had, I had some money and I had some support. And, you know, some amazing women really helped me put the work together. And... Um, you know, but right, I was told that I couldn't take on any more until I went away and came back. So I don't know what I have on. I mean, I may have nothing. Um, but no, that's not true, because the Tate has just bought a piece of my work. <laughs> it, bought, <laughs> I, it bought Frida Carlo, a homage to Frida Carlo. And, um, and I'm going to be in a show in, in, um, 23, October 23, and it's on feminist art practice. And it's going to be with a lot of the, the women that I, I've known, and most of them would be so surprised that they were going to be at the Tate. Um, so that's happening in, um, in 23. And, you know, at the moment, I'm just sort of surfing, you know. I am available, <laughs> weddings, bar mitzvahs. <laughs> All right. I want to thank uh, Rita and Janice for uh, being here and, and having this discussion. And again, thanks so much to the Caribbean Cultural Center and also to those of you who joined us today um, as well for being here. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.